Last time I tried to expand your horizon, so to speak, and talk about functions and somewhat more generality than you're used to. What I proposed then was that you're used to basically one kind of function, that is you plug in a real number and out comes a real number. And that's the typically what you see in your calculator as well. Um, I might add that, for example, you have often on your calculator a way of changing, say, two-dimensional Cartesian coordinates to two-dimensional polar coordinates. That's basically a function as well. You take an x, y, plug it in, out comes an r and theta. And that would be a, a function of a point to a point or a pair of numbers to a pair of numbers. What we're talking about now are so-called vector functions, and we see a lot of use of that in dynamic situations, particularly in physics applications. Uh, basically, the idea is you have perhaps a t-axis. Possibly, you have endpoints times, let's say, t equals a to t equals b. At some instant in that interval, t0, one finds that there corresponds not another number, which is what you've talked about in Calc 1, for example, not a number, but in fact a vector. Here may be the vector corresponding to that particular time. To give it a name, we'll use, as your book does, r as the function. And in particular, at this particular time, this would be r of t0. Now that's, in my, at least in my personal viewpoint, that's kind of a flash picture of a dynamic situation. What happened was back at time t equals a, perhaps you had a vector looking like this. And as time, let's say, uniformly moves from a to b, then the tip of this vector traced out something like this. For example, here would be the end of the picture, so to speak. If it were a moving picture, I'd have a better job today, but right now it's blackboard still. There would be the end of the moving picture. Here's your vector to begin with, and it changes direction, length, all the way through at this instant. Here we are, and continues on to this particular position here. I suggested that you might think of this as being some kind of a small fly tracing out a path in three space. Genuinely, you do have a curve, but I think students, at least initially, overlook that there is more than a curve here. There really is an idea of history. Historically, back at time t equals t0, I knew exactly where that fly was. I mean, I could release two flies, and they could fly the same path and never see each other, basically. That means they've got two histories, the same path, but two histories. So we're interested in in fact, the history of the path that you're looking at. What we talked about last time was basically how do you draw the path. That wasn't too bad. So one item that we're going to do is sketch C for a given R. The second item we're going to do is talk about the length of C. I didn't introduce this last time, partly because it's not all that necessary at this point. Let me put it in right now. If path C has length L, as you see in your book, it will be represented as some kind of, of an integral. OK, what do you put in there? Well, it depends on how your path is designated. In your book, R of t is given as f of ti, g of t, j and h of t, k, okay. with t between a and b. Now again, that looks a little bit strange, but uh, basically what I'm saying, for example, over in my picture, is at a particular time, t0, I have you know, your plain old garden variety vector sitting here, the kind that we've been spending days and days on. That is a fixed vector, at least fixed in the sense that vectors are fixed, parallel displacement still OK. But this a1 would be f at t0, a2 is g at t0, and a3 would be h at t0. The functions at that time give you the components of that particular vector. As time changes, 
these components all change. Okay, with this representation, then the length of the thing turns out to be f prime of t squared plus g prime squared plus h prime squared. Okay, don't lose the, the squares. They make all the difference in the world. Obviously, also, it looks a little like a Pythagorean rule, and in fact, it is. Where does it come from? I'm not going to give you any real details, but the idea is that if you have a, a space curve from t equals a to t equals b, and you want the length of the curve, it's kind of like the old area under a curve game. Uh, we don't know how to find the length of a smoothly turning curve other than maybe I could lay a, a piece of string down on top of it and then stretch it out, put it next to a ruler. That would be a possibility. Basically, all we know how to do is find the length of straight lines. That's what I'm saying when you stretch out the string. So what you do is you break it up into little parts and approximate each little part with a straight line segment. Right here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight approximating line segments. You'll find that each of these line segments basically has this look to it. That's where the hard part comes, actually developing this. But you can kind of see where that Pythagorean rule enters in at that point. That line segment there has something like this particular square root as its length. What we do is add up the number of line segments you have as t goes from a to b, then take the limit as the number of line segments goes to infinity. You get a finer and finer approximation. In the limit, you get your definite interval. That's kind of the story about where that thing comes from. Now that you maybe have seen the story and appreciate where it comes from, what it comes down to in a lot of your problems is plain old calc 1. If you can take the derivative of a real valued function of a real variable, you can plug it into this equation and find a length, possibly, using your uh, just learned techniques of integration also. So let's take a look at an example. This is a classic one. R of t will have cosine t as its i component, sine t for j, and just plain old t for k. And let's assume that t is going to exist between 0 and pi over 2. So we can have a nice fixed curve in mind. As I suggested last time, it's probably a good idea to cook up a table, unless the curve is just plain obvious as to what it looks like. Uh, we haven't done many three-dimensional curves, so I can't anticipate you're really got some great insights as to what those curves look like. In this case, since I'm going to zero, from 0 to pi over 2, I suspect we ought to stay with the angles we know, 30 degrees, uh, 60 degrees, 45 degrees, etc. I'll fill out that table. If you have your hand calculator, obviously, you can do a much, much better job of it. Okay, again, just to save myself, well, maybe I won't be saving myself much work. Let's put down the usual triangles for this kind of stuff. And let's see, when the t is 0, the cosine is 1, the sine is 0, and z is 0. z is equal to t. At 30 degrees, your cosine is square root of 3 over 2, and your sine is a half, and z being t is just pi over 6 itself. At 45 degrees, both x and y is square root of 2 over 2, at 60 degrees, things switch around, 
Let's go to 3 over 2 here, 1 half over here. Let's see, do I highlight wrong? Yes, 1 half here. And finally, at pi over 2, 90 degrees, the cosine is 0, the sine is 1, and we're at pi over 2 on the z-axis. So, as best you can, what you ought to do is uh, plot those points and see if you can join them up in a, a realistic way. Now again, there are a few tricks that are not what I would say well developed in your book. There are not formulas there. It's just a matter of inspecting things. And what I notice, for example, here is that if you take x, which is cosine t, and square that and add it to y squared, you get cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. What that means is that the point on this curve with coordinates x, y, z lies on the unit cylinder. The curve lies on what I'll call the unit cylinder. Again, if t is any number whatsoever, the x and y coordinates satisfy this equation, which means that the point, wherever it is, in terms of the z-axis, nonetheless has a projection into this circle. Therefore, the point lies on a cylinder. Let me put in that circle uh, like this. And then try to trace this, the curve upon that cylinder. Starting out with, at t equals 0, x equals 1, y equals 0. So here we are at t equals 0. Might I also emphasize that we're not just constructing points, we really are constructing vectors. In other words, I'm saying that at time t equals 0, my vector function equals just i, pointing down the x-axis like that. There's r at 0. Well, again, uh, I'm just giving you snapshots. The next picture was taken at t equals pi over 6. Here we are at square root of 3 over 2, 1 half. I'm just going to have to eyeball as best I can. And also, t is about, uh, what, pi over 6. Let's stretch that up to about here, let's say. So this corresponds to a vector pointing out at you, r at pi over 6. And here's the point at time 5 or 6. At 5 or 4, both x and y are equal. Maybe something like this. At pi over 3, x is a half, and y is square root of 3 over 2, and finally we end up at 0, 1. Let me put that one in last. I have a hard time joining them up as it is. Let's say this is uh, the n vector r at pi over 2 is 0i plus j plus pi over 2k. So we're pointing down the y-axis, and we've gone up pi over 2 units to this position right here. Like I left one out. I'll just kind of sneak it in there, in, uh, maybe in an obvious place. So we have one, two, three, four, five snapshots of my vector. You're supposed to imagine that as time continuously goes from 0 to pi over 2, my fly, in this case, spirals up along that particular curve around the cylinder. So the curve in question, if I make it wide enough and fudge here and there, 
should look something like that. Again, this would be better done on some kind of computer graphics device, but that's my best attempt for today. So it's not easy, but uh, I think once you've done one, you've basically done them all. It's a matter of trying to get a good perspective drawing. Perhaps analyze the problem a little bit more carefully with some other information that you might get just by looking at it. And like, for example here, knowing it lies on the cylinder, then I've got this curve that kind of wraps itself around the cylinder. If I let T go on to pi, then my fly would go on around behind where it started, way up there at pi units, and then as t went on, it would go spiraling all the way up. Question? Where's that x squared plus y squared does one come from? From my head. Every time I see a cosine and a sine, that's the first thing that comes to mind, you know. What happens if you square them and add them together? What we're going to say, I haven't written it this way too often, but you'll see this very frequently in many textbooks. Your radius vector points to that particular position, x, y, z, where x is this, y is this, z is this. Well, notice I said to myself, x squared plus y squared equals 1. That means whenever this vector points out to that point, for example, the x, y coordinates satisfy x squared plus y squared equals 1. That means the projection of the point projection of the point satisfies the equation of a circle. That means the point itself has to be somewhere on that cylinder, just as an aid for graphing. If I were sitting down at a keyboard or a computer, graphics screen right in front of me, I could care less that this relation holds, because the machine's going to do that very accurately. But just as an aid to myself, I've got to say to me, gee, if it's in this cylinder, then it's going to have something like that shape right there. Now, if, if you're sitting there, in the library doing your homework, you could take a ruler and get these altitudes proper, and then you'd have a, a much better chance at getting that, that sketch as well. But uh, so far, doing it by hand is not easy. Any other questions on this one? Anyone happen to know what this thing is called, really? Let me kind of flatten it down. What happened was that we came around basically like that, stopped over there in the yz plane. Okay, so what happens if time were allowed to go on? Remember the point that the vector is pointing at always lies on the cylinder. Also, the altitude increases linearly with time. So what happens is, as I just said, this comes out around behind comes back up here and goes through the whole process one more time. On and on and on. Of course, you could back it up as, as well. Uh, time in the other direction. Anyone know what the name of that is, other than spring? Oh, that's good. I'll at least teach you something today. It's called a helix. I bet some of you have heard it already, and that is uh, the name of it great studies in DNA molecules, double helices, co-spiraling helices, etc. That's the kind of stuff we're, we're talking about here. Well, again, it's not too exciting, but you do need to know that vector functions give you paths, but I still want to emphasize that they really give you a history of a path. You know, we could talk about a fly that uh, starts here and goes about half as fast. So the two, fl two flies take off, this one's done, and this one catches up. And so I was talking about before, you basically have two different histories, but the same result, same end result. But, you know, what's happening is that one fly is flying faster than the other one, twice as fast perhaps. So how can we analyze that kind of a situation? Well, let's go back to Calc 1. Uh, what did you do to find velocity? If you had a distance function, you took a derivative. Derivative is rate of change of dependent variable on independent variable. Rate of change of distance with respect to time, that's velocity. And we're going to do the same thing here. 
if you have some satellite following some particular orbit, how fast is it traveling? What direction is it going? What acceleration does it experience? Those kinds of questions can be analyzed by vectors, dynamic vectors, and some notions of derivative. So that gets us going in a, into the next section. And that's basically the knowledge of motion, which we'll, we'll start talking about a little bit later. But uh, let's just really summarize quite dramatically Uh, I was reading the book, it uh, barely held my interest because everything they did was just what we did back in Calc 1, just exactly. If you don't believe me, you should read it. As I talked about it yesterday, there's the notion of limit uh, that exists for vector functions as well. Continuity. in the book, derivatives. Now this is where we get a little bit more interested because this is where we're going to use the tool. So let me write it down. For example, in this particular case, uh, what is the time derivative of r at t0? If you take the derivative of a vector, what do you think you should get out of it? It's a good question. Uh, but if you just mimic calc 1, What you do is you say, well, let's take the limit as delta t goes to 0 of the function at t0 plus delta t minus the function at t0 all over delta t. All I'm doing is flipping the pages back to chapter whatever and saying, well, if it were little f, then back there in calc 1, the, the definition of derivative look like this. There, that's to refresh your memory. That's what I mean by calc 1. So I'm just going to mimic the thing, replace f, a scalar function, with a vector function. Uh, that means I have to replace f with r here, f with r here, etc. Now, back in calc 1, we had some interesting ideas of what this was. This is a uh, really the secant slope between two points. And as you let the second point approach the first, the secant slope became the tangent slope. And we talked about tangent lines to curves and went on our merry way in all kinds of different directions. And we hope to do the same thing here. But if I just throw in that definition there, what do you think I should write down for a, let's say, practical computational device to find a derivative? If that's r of t, and I define its derivative like this, anybody want to make a guess as to how you would take a specific case, let's say this one right here, and tell me what the derivative is? Okay, if that's too general, what would the derivative be if you're going to make a guess for that function right there? r prime of t would be what? Minus sine t times i. I don't. I don't want the. Turns out I don't want the uh, the vectors to disappear. Cosine t j and just one times k. So what you've just told me in that specific case seems to say, and in fact, it's a proven theorem in your book that with this definition you will find that it's f prime of t at i plus g prime of t at j plus h prime of t at k. And this is also true, of course, for any t. So let's put it for a general t like that. Well, it looks like you're just playing games, you know. Uh, 
okay, there's a definition. What good is it? In fact, it doesn't look like much more than what we did in Calc 1. Instead of three functions, you got three derivatives staring you in the face. What good is it? What are you going to use it for? Well, let me present you a little bit of geometry, perhaps to satisfy that curiosity. Here we go. Let's assume we have our space curve, C. Uh, going back to my original definition, I would take at time t equals zero, let me assume that that is my vector. It's pointing right there, time t equals zero. What we're supposed to do is take a snapshot a little bit later at time t equals zero plus delta t. So there's the second participant in this derivative. Now the numerator, what's that going to be? The difference of two vectors. Anyone give me any words as to what that would look like in my picture? What's r of t0 plus delta t minus r of t0? What would that be? Anyone tell me words where that vector would appear up here? Okay, if this is one vector and this is the, the other, what's th this one minus this one? One between them. One between them, right. So what you see here, let's say right there, is r at t0 plus delta t, the first vector, minus the second one. You know, it's the old diagonal process, parallelogram, law, whatever you want to call it. Now, if I divide that, this is your numerator up here in purple. If I divide that by delta t, let's assume delta t is positive, and let's say small, which is what it's supposed to be, then what you probably will see is this vector here. Um, okay, let's, let's do it right here. This would be r at t0 plus delta t minus r at t0. And what, I, what I've done is rescaled by delta t.